I'm Anna Webb. Welcome to A Dog's Life. just been through quite a significant moment in British history, which is why we're about to jump on Zoom and speak to author Georgina Montague about her new book called Top Dogs, A British Love Affair. Georgina, welcome to A Dog's Life. Well, thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm so excited about this because we're going to be chatting about your very different coffee table book called Top Dogs, A British Love Affair. Is that right? Yes, we we came up with that title because it really is just such a love affair when it comes to your dog. Everybody loves their dogs so much that it seemed like it was the best possible name. Absolutely. So what is it all about? Well, um, it's about... It's really about devoted British people, everybody's British in the book, at home with their beloved dogs, talking to them, talking about what they mean to them, little stories about them, um, just a sort of a, a sort of essay, really, to, to, to the dog, to everybody's dog. So this episode is, is going out just under a week after the Queen's funeral. So the Queen herself isn't in this book. I know. However, I, I know. <laughs> but the, Queen, the, the Queen's consort, Camilla Parker Bowles, of course, is. Yes, I know. Well, we, we are very, very thrilled to have her. She actually wrote us a beautiful um, forward for the book, um, talking about her own two rescued Jack Russells, Beth and Bluebell, um, and tells us a little bit about them and talks about the charity that the book is in aid of, which is um, Medical Detection Dogs, which I, I think you actually know quite a lot about. As I <laughs> Yes, no, I do. I, <laughs> I'm really proud, actually. I did launch the charity and yes. I worked for them for, for many years, actually, before I, oh gosh, started to do sort of radio things and everything. And I know the link there is with Camilla because Camilla is actually the patron, is she not? Yes, she is. She is. And um, so she loves to do things to help. And in fact, she did take the Queen to see it. Um, and I and we even asked the Queen to be in the book. But um, she did. She did say no, even though I wrote on a very big piece of paper and hoped it would stand out from the crowd and almost got there because we got we got a call from the from the lady in waiting to say, um, you know, they were talking about it. But she did say no. So we never ended up with the lovely Corgi, sadly. Georgina, you know, the cover of the book is extremely yes. striking and it features arguably the largest breed. Well, it is actually the largest breed of dog um, in dogdom, the Irish Wolfhound. Explain a bit more. Well, yes, that's um, Turlo Moore. He's um, otherwise known as Seamus and he's a, he's a wolfhound. And he's um, the 17th regimental mascot of the Irish Guards. Um, and he's photographed on the front of the book in the beautiful Guards Chapel in London. There was a big conversation about who we should have, and he just seemed the most, so sort of summed it all up, really. Um, and, of course, after the Platinum Jubilee, he became a sort of Instagram star. Everybody knew about him because he, he led the parade down the mall and everything. And um, he marches front and centre of the regiment's parade with his lovely handler, who I talked to, Adam Walsh. And... Um, He's just really rather wonderful. He's very calm and he was, he was lovely to meet. Yes, well, the training he must have, because Irish wolfhounds, you know, essentially they are a sight hound. So, you know, they're triggered by moving things. So at the um, Platinum Jubilee, you know, I was astounded by how, because he's young, how well behaved he was. And I was also a bit disappointed not to see him involved with the Queen's funeral procession, Georgina. I know. I suppose they didn't want him to upstage the corgis. <laughs> um, no, yeah, no, I, I thought I of they, that. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know, but I think maybe it would be too much, too much really, to have him there or something. Um, but he, he, he has the whole sort of kit. You know, he has all the Irish Guard outfits and the, the sort of special dog version of them all and everything actually, except the big bearskin hat. And he puts them on, and then he knows he's working. Um, they, they said it was easy to train him. Actually, he's obviously a very kind of 
clever dog, um, very um, responsive and kind of rather, rather sweet natured, I thought, when I met him. Oh, wow. Um, he's, he's in, yes, I met him, met not most of the dogs. I mean, he's, 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 he's huge when he stands up. He's six foot three when he stands up. And he eats enormous amounts of food. He eats um, something like I think it was one and a half kilograms of biscuits a day and, and has sort of, when they give him a treat, it might be a sort of a whole roast chicken or, a, you know, something like that. I mean, <laughs> he eats a lot. Yeah. Funnily enough, we've got a tiny dog in the book. We've got a chihuahua in the book. Well, let's talk about the little chihuahua because doesn't she belong to a very famous fashion guru? Um, the, the chihuahua actually belongs to Lil Rice, who, who um, well, she used to run Gifford Circus. She's the person who's taken over from Nell Gifford, who started Gifford's. Yeah. Right. Yeah. OK. But there are lots of fashion icons. I mean, Jasper Conran, I know, is in the book. Yes, you've got about... Jasper Conran. Yeah. And I, I love the way he describes basically that it is a love affair with dogs as after he lost his first dog you know he describes his grief as being something really primeval like yes, I know. yeah which pulled at my heartstrings georgina explain a bit more well it was just very sweet really everybody everybody was like that it was you know when you talk to people about their dogs it just takes them on to all kinds of other other things you know you talk about a dog and you you talk in a completely different way than if you had been talking to them about their children or their jobs or their houses because they're very neutral territory to talk about so it kind of opens up their whole world and they even the most private kind of unlikely people the most sort of famous sort of you know people who hardly ever speak to the press completely drop their guard and launch forth you know with no filter telling me all kinds of things and I don't know why I think it's because dog talk sort of has no expectation really or baggage attached to it so you know suddenly you're talking to Jasper Conran about his terrible crying about his dog or somebody else about you know something else and, and um it just leads on to everything really. Yeah, it, it does. It does. But I, I love Jasper Conran because I often meet people for coffee in his Marylebone uh, shop because um, it's very dog friendly. So it makes a perfect uh, meeting place kind of yeah, in lovely. town. Yes. But there's people that I actually in the book didn't know had a dog. And I'm quite aware of people with dogs. And, and the one that interests me only because I love the television show he presents is, of course, Philip of Fake or Fortune. Yes, absolutely. Well, he's... um Philip Mould, isn't it? Philip Mould. He was the first person in our book. And he was just literally full of wonderful love for his whippet, um, Cedric. And he's since then got another another one called Bunny. He, he, he just was quite poetic, really. He said that there was a whippet-shaped place in his heart which was filled and he didn't even know it was there until he got a bit it and it was um it was a lovely and wonderful photographs of him at his lovely house in Gloucestershire because yeah. that's another aspect of the book isn't it Georgina it's about interiors and almost the whole lifestyle circle of of the book would you say you know how perhaps their interior fuses with their dog um and the human that kind of links the two together, or is that not right? Yeah, I think we're absolutely right. Yes, definitely, very much like that. Going quickly back to the the royal connection, you know, because it's it's very you know up in everybody's minds at the moment. We know about the Queen's beautiful, beautiful fell pony called Emma, who I spotted during the funeral procession. So I watched watched it live. I honestly believe she knew the Queen was passing her in the hearse, as the Queen did, in fact, because she'd been so stock still, Georgina, stock still, and knowing she was one of the calmest ponies apparently on the planet, she suddenly, as the hearse sort of hit the screen with its windscreen, you know, the bonnet had passed, and then the windscreen's parallel with Emma and her handler, and she started to throw her head back and Amazing. started to stomp as pony stomp. And it really it made me gasp, to be honest. And it was interesting. The cameras were obviously thinking, uh-oh, the pony might do something we 
don't want to see on screen, like rear up or something, or bite the handler or bolt, I don't know, but they cut <laughs> away. They they cut away quickly when they saw Emma start to become a bit agitated. And I thought that was fascinating. Yes, I mean, I think they just know. They, they do, don't they? That they, they know so much. They know almost like they know how you're feeling when, when you don't even know how you're feeling yourself. They kind of just come along and and sort of do the right thing. They do. But interestingly in the book, there is a relative of Emma the Fell Pony. Yes, well, that's Sunny the Fell, Fell Pony. And Sunny the Fell Pony, um, well, she actually, is, that's what actually sadly died, but she did used to live on this beautiful farm in Cumbria with the shepherdess, Alison O'Neill, the lovely shepherdess, who, who's in the book with her and lovely um, enchanting sheepdog Shadow. And um, Shadow's big thing is, is forming special friendships with particular animals on the farm, Alison was explaining to me. And um, one of the most special at all was Sunny, this, this lovely fell pony, um, whose sister does happen to be the Queen's fell pony, the one that we all saw on television. Oh, wow. So they yeah, literally yes. share the same parents. Yeah, they do, I think, both parents. Yes, and apparently Shadow and Sunny used to sit for hours kind of watching the view together from the farm. They just sort of, well, I suppose actually Shadow was sitting and <laughs> probably Sunny was standing, but they used to just sort of stand there looking at the, the shadows and the swallows. And uh, Alison was just trying to, to, to describe all that to me and and just talking about how dogs really do know about death. And when um, Shad Shadow had another special friend, Rose, a sheep, and when Rose was dying, she was lying in a sort of, a barn with her head on Alison's knee and Shadow was curled up to her, licking her ear and she was describing all this to me. And then a few moments, just literally moments before she died, Sonny, the fell pony, came in to join them just at exactly the right moment and was just sort of standing there in the little robin that they all knew. And I don't know, it's rather lovely the way she described it. Gosh, I'm <laughs> boiling up a bit. Um... <laughs> That's so beautiful. And I, I agree, you know, I think interspecies communication, it's so poignant, really, to highlight it in this book, because that's what this book's about. It's about yeah. our relationship with dogs. You know, we are, you know, we're humans. And it's talking to humans about their relationships with their dogs. But indeed, what about relationships with dogs and other species? It so does exist. I, I know because I've got a cat, you see, in the mix. And um, I won't wax on about Gremlin, my cat now. But I've got some extraordinary moments I could share between him and the dogs. And it, it's interesting. And they can be friends. But can we just go back to the Queen Consort for one second? Because... I feel we're in, in good hands with her at the moment, I think, and King Charles, not least because you know, King Charles is a great fan of homeopathy, which for me puts him in a very good light, as did the Queen, because she was very into homeopathy, and but also because of, you know, global warming and the climate and, and the planet, you know, I know he can't have any political views, but at the end of the day, still good that he's very interested in these things, I think. But the Queen Consort, I mean, she's also a patron of Battersea Cats and Dogs Home, isn't she? Yes, and I think that's why she usually gets her dogs from there, and Beth and Bluebell were from there. And they've had very sad lives, and now they've got wonderful lives. They will leave, they'll soon be in, in the garden at Buckingham Palace, so they'll have a really good life. But even now, they've got a wonderful, you know, of course, they've got a lovely life at Clarence House and Highgrove, and, and they're completely adored. Which is very brilliant. Happy ending for them. Yeah, because yeah. it takes quite a lot of courage to take on a rescue, I think. Yes. Um, particularly, I think one of her rescues, I, I think it was Beth, might have been Bluebell, that was literally found as a very, very young puppy. And if she'd not been found, she would definitely have died. She was bald with a few tufts of hair and in a completely awful mess. <laughs> Yes, I think she was found abandoned in the woods, and and um, she certainly one thing that she really she I remember her saying that you know it's the main thing she said that she just simply can't imagine her life or her sofas without her dogs, which of course is the same for all of us, you know. Once you have a dog, you can't imagine not, you know. And she's just such a dog dog lover, and you can really tell someone's a good egg when they love their dogs. I mean, you know, look at the Queen, look at look at all these people who we look up to. You see a whole new side of people when you when you talk to them about their dog. Yes, and what surprised me in the book, it's somebody who I really, again, this is why I've loved the book, because I've learned things. I had no idea that Andrew Lloyd Webber 
was such a dog lover because, of course, he's very famous for the musical Cats. I didn't really think that that might have made him more of a cat lover than a dog lover. I mean, it was a fabulous production, but I just thought he was into T.S. Eliot, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> but um, tell us a bit more about Andrew Lloyd Webber and what was it like meeting him? Well, I think he has always been a cat's person, actually, funnily enough. He's had oh. these amazing, amazing sort of special, rare, rather high-strung kind of cats. I'm going to get the name wrong if I try and tell you the name, but I can't remember. Um, but he has recently got Havanese, well, not a couple of years ago, got a Havanese. Um, and his Havanese literally trots around after him everywhere, from, from his home at Sidmonton, which is on Watership Down in Hampshire, um, to even when he comes to London, that Mojito goes with him to the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane and has even been to Broadway in New York with him. And really? he takes him with him and he um he, he they're they're inseparable, actually, I think. They they really are. And he, he's, you know, a lovely little dog and he's quite small and sort of black with a little white bit on him. And he sits there through all the compositions, you know, good as gold when they're being recorded and I tried to I, I tried to make a little joke about whether he was musical, and Andrew told me very seriously, you know, he's not remotely musical. So, you know, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> he, he he does a funny thing at, at, at dinner time. He sits on a special stool at, at the table with the Lloyd Webbers. He doesn't have a dog bowl like most dogs. He sits on a special little stool, and he which brings him up to exactly the right height, and he he has whatever they're having. So, you know, if they're having fish, he has a little plate of that, or chicken, or whatever. And um, so he's a, he's an absolute member of the family almost more than most <laughs> and he sleeps with Andrew and Madeline on the pillow between them apparently if, if, if he if he can he, he was really sort of forthcoming about his dog and you would never expect that you know that's what, sort of what I mean he, he hardly any interviews about him at home and yet when you're speaking to him about people about their dogs they just sort of tell you everything it is really interesting and yeah I like him all the more for this yes and, no absolutely yeah and I love <laughs> I love a Havanese I know um Robbie Williams um actually the singer you know loves his Havanese and they're um a lovely little dog actually and I don't think they molt too much because they have hair rather than fur you know so they have a coat that's completely different to a Labrador you know for example yeah and they're tiny too aren't they they're very small and portable Yes, yes. So I think um, actually Robbie Williams, he was able to fly with his in the cabin, which I'm sure, you know, might have been because he was who he was or is who he is, I should say, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, but, you know, in the book, who would you say then owned the naughtiest dog from your chats with people? Oh, naughty. People did have naughty stories. I mean, I definitely minnow is quite naughty Jasper Conrad's dog. He, he's always leaving paw prints all over his drawings and things like that. And um, who else was there? There was um, there, there were two wonderful pugs who lived in a house called Woolston Hall in Norfolk, and one of them was had a total thing for tapestries, and he was peeing all over the Elizabeth Frinks and the Joe Miros and the oh, my bitch to pass more and all and, you know all, and what other things? Oh, then there's a very naughty one, Trevor Robinson's pug dog Pugsy. He he just chews everything up. Seems absolutely amazing. Seems to chew through all the furniture, all the skirting boards everything um i don't know it was destruction really that people were talking about i think when when you asked about naughtiness that's what the first thing they talked about everybody gosh i mean i'd i'd be mortified if if, some, if a dog destroyed my elizabeth frink i mean I we're know. talking there's a big difference <laughs> isn't there from an ikea table leg to you know a miro an original miro <laughs> oil know, or right. something i mean can you imagine the difference in your stress levels <laughs> i know i think they were tapestries i think he's got a thing i think they were all tapestries i think he's got a thing for them he just you know but you know there's lots of different breeds in in the book i mean you know we've got the the biggest dog, you know, Seamus. We've got the the smallest breed and several pugs that are known to be quite naughty. Actually, pugs. I mean, they do a very strong, almost bullish type personalities. But you've also got Staffordshire Bull Terriers in there and British Bulldogs. Yes, yes, yes. We have. We've got lots of. We've got all kinds of dogs. Yeah, and the good old Jack Russells, which you know, for me, you can't go wrong with. Really, a straightforward Jack Russell. You you know what you've got there. Fiery temperament, loads of energy, great personality, a massive sense of humour, 
and they're impossible to train. <laughs> <laughs> All the things we like. <laughs> exactly. But yeah. um, Georgina, tell us about where it all began. You know, now I know you've got a standard poodle, which I'm really jealous of because it's something I long, long to have, actually, I think, a standard poodle. I love poodles and I, I get upset a bit that poodles, you only see poodles now as half a dog, like a cavapoo or a cockapoo and and the list goes on when in fact for me a whole poodle <laughs> would be the answer in many of these situations well i know i love poodles i do i am a bit of a purist when it comes to whether they're pure or not well they're of course i i you know, like all the others too but um i i've had two i've got rollo now and i had um albert before that and i you could say it was in my veins as my my great grandmother was a standard poodle breeder um and she had a huge great kennel in east sussex um in the 1950s actually right as early as 1930s but it was there for a long time with over 100 of them so she wow. had all these enormous dogs and i think they were it was quite a world and she actually used to have their hair their sort of clippings when they had that when they were groomed spun into wool and made into tweed so when i was growing up my father had a beautiful poodle wool sort of overcoat which was made in Savile Road because she gave all her grandsons a sort of bolt of tweed and they they all made them into different things sort of suits and coats and things like that so I I was you know I was brought up with all that around me and um I d decided a sort of a few years ago that I'd have a go making them myself so um actually the one that we're all is sitting on the floor right here but the one he's wearing today it's made of vintage poodle tweed, tweed which was spun from these original poodles in um in sussex and um sort of mixed with organic merino wool so that it, it, it makes a nicer color oh gosh yeah. georgina that's so emotional yeah. actually um <laughs> because it was so funny oh, yeah my auntie was mad about poodles and they were such an iconic breed really and then i i don't know why they you know, went away from popularity, whether people sort of considered them, I don't know, girly dogs or dogs that were associated only with film stars like Marilyn Monroe or something. And they didn't want to be like, you know, there's the association, isn't there? You know, uh, yes, being yes. perhaps a woman's dog, but they're not. I mean, they, they are a highly tuned, most intelligent gun dog. <laughs> Yeah, no, they really are. They're very sporty and very, very good swimmers and very, um, they're very athletic. Yes. So did you, I'm fascinated now by, was it your grandmother? My great grandmother. Great, great grandmother. Gran yeah. well, great grandmother. Did she have all the colours of poodles? So, you know, yes, the white, no, she did. Grand... Absolutely. Black, wow. brown, silver, the whole lot. Yeah. The whole lot. So yeah. you could really make a fabulous tweed out of that with all those colour combinations. Yes, I think it was a bit of a mixture once it all went in. It went a bit sort of browny coloured, really. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> how lovely! You know how absolutely lovely. So, what do you see about yourself in a poodle? Oh my goodness, that's a very well, difficult. Question. Well, if dogs are like their owners, after all, Georgina, you know, because I think in this <laughs> book you've got so many different amazing people, and they've all got very, very different dogs because for example i don't know if you asked princess anne i wish you had because then my own favorite breed would have been in this book oh yeah i'm sorry we haven't got one yeah no. <laughs> because i think you know again that says a lot to me about princess anne you know in a good way to be honest that she's stuck by the bull terrier for yes. all her life through thick and thin actually but we won't go there now yeah, you know, that says a lot about her, determined, strong, you know, she'll stand her ground. She won't take anything from anybody lightly, but she is dedicated and, and driven and all of these great traits, you know, that the Bull Terrier has. She's also a comedian you know she's got a great smile about her she'll jest with people and rib them and just know how far to push it actually um i hope i'm okay giving this character reference of princess anne i have met her once actually <laughs> but i mean it's it's all very complimentary you know she puts on and equally we won't go there but the queen with choosing corgis because they're very strong dogs you know people think they're low to the ground and, and cute looking with their pointy ears you know but they are a very very very, very tough herding dog that was bred by the Vikings, you know, and brought over when they invaded everywhere and became a really useful dog for driving cattle to market. Yeah. But going back to that, so Georgina, tell me, if dogs are like their owners, why do you love poodles? 
I don't know. I, I, can't, I have to really think about that one, I'm afraid. The question people ask me more than whether people like their dog coach, I think anybody's asked me that until today, is whether they look like their dogs. Everybody kept saying, do people look like their dogs? You know, whenever yes. I said I book it. And I think, you know, some of them do look bizarrely like them. There's one person that literally looks, I mean, he looks like he, you know, so like his, his, his wife, looks so like the Saluki, it's like he married the Saluki. And, um, but then some others were completely, completely different. Like, um, well, there was a, a, an interior designer with a curly hair who told me she nearly got a wicket um, because she wanted to be one. But um, you know, because people <laughs> people sort of think, I suppose, if they get a certain dog, they, they're going to turn into them. Um, Philip Mould, he carries his Cedric around. He said it was his nearest thing to having his childhood dream of having a pet falcon on his shoulder. I mean, you know, people have sort of reasons that they that they get dogs you know sometimes people said well, i was surprised by what people had you know like john porson who's you know the severe kind of minimalist architect you know you would expect to have a great big deer hound or i don't know something spiky of some sort he had a fluffy little cockapoo and he literally adores him he just adores him but he's nothing less like john porson sort of aesthetic you could possibly think of that's interesting yes <laughs> except he is the same color as the Cotswold stone exactly so he, he he you know he blends in perfectly when you know when he <laughs> lies down in front of the house yeah, yeah no no well so indeed quite architectural you know yeah um so maybe that that was part of it no it just fascinates me um you know why people choose certain breeds because you know for me it is so important to choose the right dog you know for your lifestyle and your experience really yeah you know that, that perhaps can be mirrored in the book by some of the greats that you have in here Yes. Well, I mean, it's also for people, I suppose people who don't know much about dogs. I mean, they, they, you know, they can read it, they can see it, they can sort of understand the impact dogs have on people's lives and, and, and what and what the different sorts of dogs are and what they mean to people. And because it sort of means the same things to everyone, really, doesn't it? It doesn't matter if you're the old Jasper Conran or the Irish Guards or the Queen, you know, it all, it's all, there's something universal about a dog absolutely absolutely yeah. what did people generally think about the idea that proceeds from the book would go to medical detection dogs well i think they loved it because it's such a great charity as you know it's you know that the way they're sniffing out for these diseases and they um they can sniff for cancer and well that's the main sort of thing that everybody knows about but they also malaria parkinson's and and actually, it, I started the book in COVID and um, they were just learning to smart, stop, sniff for COVID. So that was another reason everybody sort of knew about them then. I think, you know, it, it was it was it was actually very everyone. I think if we did do it to help the charity. Um, but I also think everybody did it because they were just longing to have their dog in, in a beautiful, great, big, glossy coffee book with a beautiful picture by Dylan, because he has taken the most fantastic pictures, as we've seen. Um, and, you know, there's there's really nothing. In the age of Instagram, when you're always taking a picture, snapping an old dog every time it moves, you know, every walk that looks nice on, but then you come home and you don't really have any very good pictures. No, I know. <laughs> I tell you, kind of, you know I'm I mean? on your <laughs> page, Georgina. I think a good camera with someone yeah. who knows what they're doing beats it every time, uh, to be honest. I mean, almost everybody I asked, like directly through a friend, said yes, literally in 30 seconds, because they just couldn't resist it. They couldn't resist having a you know, something, their dog in a book for posterity, I suppose. No, it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, it's, it really is wonderful. And where can people get it? Well, they can get it from the, the publisher's website, which is um, Triglyph website. And um, they can get it in most bookshops, I hope. They can, I, I don't want to say the word Amazon, but I think it probably is on there. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> but it's good that it is, you know, Georgina. Yes, no, of course yes. it's there. Um, and um, it'll be everywhere, I hope. I hope it'll be everywhere. And I hope it'll be um, a lovely thing to give someone for Christmas. It'll sort of make everybody um, enjoy. And I hope it's enjoyed by lots of people. I'm sure it will be. And of course, all the links to where you can get the book will be in the show notes. Georgina, thank you so much for sharing this and your energy and your passion and real enthusiasm and true love for dogs <laughs> well it was lovely to be on here thank you so much thank you so much for having me that's our show mr binks what did you think yes i know irish wolfhounds definitely are the largest breed of dog and what's that yes you're right it's time for woof of the week <laughs> the wonderful thing about dogs 
is that they are great levelers and they bring out the best in us. They are man's best friend. <laughs> Well, I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, go on, rate and review the show wherever you tune into your podcasts. Thanks again to Georgina, and all of the links to buy the book are in the show notes. Thanks, of course, to Mike Hansen, my producer, for all the production and the music as ever. Find out more about him at Pod People UK. And for me, I'm just at Anna Webb Dogs. What's that, Mr. Binks? You're right. We will be back in your feed next Sunday. So if you haven't already, go on, please subscribe. It's free. And that way, you'll never miss another show. Bye for now.